Welcome, welcome everybody to the Story Worthy Hour of Power. I'm so excited everybody's here with me tonight. Can everybody hear me okay? It's looking good. All right, looking good. You guys, I have pulled together four of the most amazing storytellers in Los Angeles to kick off my premiere show of the Story Worthy Hour of Power. You're gonna hear some great stories this evening, and I gotta tell you, you've heard all of these talents before on the Story Worthy Podcast, but tonight, you're gonna to hear them right now, live and in your living room, and so we're gonna get started in just a moment. I wanna make sure everybody's been admitted. Uh, people still might be trickling in. We'll let them come in. Apparently, people had problems parking, you know, how that is. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to be sharing my own story in just a minute, but we're going to kick off the show right now with a fabulous talent. This girl, she's been on Story Worthy before, of course. She's a stand-up comedian and a storyteller, and she's performed all over the United States. She has performed on The Moth and on KPCC's Unheard LA, and she's headlined at the Ice House here in Los Angeles. Her film, The Poacher, was shown in numerous film festivals across the United States. You guys, please help me kick off the story where the hour of power with one and only Kelly Spillman. Uh, thank you. I'm so excited to tell a story. I could not have asked for a better manager at the subway I worked at. Greg was... Unlike any other manager I'd had before, I mean, it was my freshman year at Florida State, so I technically had had only one other job. I worked at a United Artists Theater in concessions, but those managers, like they never small talked with us, they never helped us, they just sat in the office all day, but not Greg. He was like a hands-on general manager. He would help us cut all the veggies and make the tuna. He remembered what classes I was taking at Florida State. He was always asking me about it. We talked current events. He was like the original Shazam, like any song that played on the radio. He would know who sang it, what the song is. Uh, he knew that uh, this song that I loved by Love Split Love, that the lead singer was Richard Butler, but that he was also in Psychedelic Furs. Like, he was just such an impressive man. And... Even on my days off, I could like skip the line at Subway and come in and grab a large cup and just get soda for free every day. Uh, so I just really enjoyed working with him. In fact, Subway was like the best job ever, except for my coworker, Angela. She was blissfully dumb. If you went into our subway and asked her for a six inch, you either got a three inch or 10 inch sandwich. Like she never figured out how to cut the bread in half. She talked all the time, but knew nothing. And so anytime a song would come on, no matter what song it was, she would just go, oh, I love R.E.M. When it was Depeche Mode or Prince. I mean, come on. Uh, she always had migraines, so she would literally lay on the floor during our shifts. I had to step over her to make sandwiches. It was, she was the worst. So one night we were working, it was right before closing, and Greg left the store with Angela. And my coworker, Autumn, said, look who's leaving with his mistress. And I go, Autumn, that's not funny. Greg is married. He's an honorable man. Don't even joke about that. Like everything's not a Jerry Springer episode. And Autumn goes, Kelly, why would a 37-year-old man be leaving the store at 10 o'clock at night with an 18-year-old employee? And I was really quick with my comeback that obviously he's going to fire her because she's the worst employee in Subway's history. But since he's an honorable man, he's going to do it outside. He's not going to embarrass her in front of everyone. I was just so annoyed. I didn't know Autumn very well. And it was such a disrespectful thing to say for such a great guy. So I kind of walked out uh, to clean off some of the tables because I was just so upset with her for saying that. It's not even funny to joke about. And I had noticed that there was this car that was sitting right in front of our subway. And... At our subway, we only had an oil change place next to us. We were the only two businesses um, in this shopping center, and they had obviously closed hours ago. 
So it was just really odd to see these two men just sitting in the car in front of our subway. So when I was cleaning up the table, I finally got like a good look in the car. And both of the men were looking at me in a way that I quickly realized we were about to be robbed. And so I didn't want them to know that I figured out they're about to rob us. And so I was trying to get Autumn's attention that we're about to be robbed. And so I started to hide the money in the cash register, like underneath the boiled ham and in the lettuce, uh, because I knew they were going to get, I knew they were going to rob us, but I'm like, you're not getting all of Subway's money. Like this isn't going to happen. And Autumn was on board too. She was hiding money in the potato chips. And if you've ever been to Subway, you see that the knife we use to cut the bread is this horrible, it doesn't work very well. It's small, dingy. Uh, and so I just grabbed like a bunch of extra spoons and put them in the meatballs. There were really no other weapons. Uh, this was the fall of 1992. So there were no cell phones to call the cops. And we did have one phone, but it was inside Greg's office and he was outside firing Angela. So I wasn't too worried because I knew Greg was going to be back any second and that hopefully would scare them off. And I realized at the time, if any of you visited Subway in 1992, you probably are very familiar with our rewards program where you got stickers for each sub purchase. And if you got 12 stickers, you had a free foot long. Well, the stickers came on this really big roll, like thousands of stickers. And so I realized I got to get these stickers out of here. So I started to crawl on the floor toward the stickers. And that's when Autumn is like, Kelly, stop it. This is ridiculous. They're going to know that we are onto them. But they would have had free subs for years. And I was like, not on my watch. I can't do this. So luckily, I got the stickers down, crawled to the walk-in cooler, hid the stickers. And so at this point, we're like 20 minutes in. And the, the men, they just kept looking at us. And so I'm kind of at the point like, why haven't they robbed us yet? I mean, I'm glad they didn't, but, and so all of a sudden they finally both start looking behind them in the car, like looking back. And that's when it hit me. Oh my gosh, they've been waiting on their accomplices. Now we're really in trouble. And Autumn also quickly realized how serious this was. And so she decided our only way to survive in this situation was she was going to move her car to the back door so we had a getaway car. Now, I did not want her to do that. I thought it was like so brave. And what if they grabbed her when she went outside? So, but she was like, Kelly, this is the only way we're going to survive this. So she went outside and walked past their car, walked to her car way further down. And I saw her drive away. And that's when it hit me. She may have just gone home and left me here alone to deal with these invaders. And so uh, we had a password that she would only say it if the accomplices didn't have her. And I was waiting and waiting and I'm not hearing her at the back door. And then finally I hear her knock and scream minute mate. That was our key password that we knew the invaders would not know. And so I opened the door and I let her in and I just couldn't believe how brave she was to have a getaway car for us. Now uh, we come back in and the car was gone. We outsmarted the invaders. I know, we couldn't believe it. And we, I think the adrenaline was just, we were so pumped that uh, then we just started laughing at how ridiculous that we had no weapons. We only had three spoons and a knife that barely works. Uh, and so at that moment, Greg comes back in but he comes back in with Angela and her shirts all, the buttons are all off. And so it's very clear they had just hooked up. And it's very clear he didn't fire her, so she's still technically a Subway sandwich artist. 
Now, I thought I was so close to Greg before when he would have a day off, I would always fill him in on all the shenanigans that would go down at Subway. And he asked, hey, how did it go tonight? What happened? And I just said, oh, it's fine. And Autumn and I just rolled our eyes at each other. I decided he wasn't worthy of my stories anymore. We were truly left in danger without keys to get into the safe. And he cheated on his wife with Angela, the worst employee of Subway ever. And so it was just devastating to me that I had put this guy on a pedestal thinking he was this impressive man that was not impressive at all. And the next week, Autumn actually helped me get a job at uh, waiting tables uh, where I had managers that did not small talk with me did not help me when we were slammed. And they basically just sat in their offices. And I was actually cool with that. I've decided that's how I like my managers. Uh, thank you all for listening. I'm Kelly Spillman. This was a blast. Thank you so much. All right, you guys. That was amazing. Kelly Spillman. Uh, you guys, I'm super excited that you're here joining me for the very first Story Worthy Hour of Power. Kelly Spillman, what a funny girl. I love that story. And I can't go past the subway without thinking about that girl, Amber, and how she couldn't cut the bread. I love that detail where there's a three-inch side and a ten-inch side. Just a great story. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, now I thought I would share with you guys a story of my own. And uh, this happened a few years ago, about five years ago. I had uh, comedian Yakov Smirnoff on my podcast, Story Worthy. I don't know if you guys remember Yakov Smirnoff. He's a Russian comedian. He's only about five, six, five foot six tall, five foot six inches tall. And uh, anyway, he came on my show and we actually had a really good podcast. It went very well and uh, we became friends. So we would, uh, you know, go out to dinner and sometimes play tennis. Uh, were we dating? No. No, of course not. He's like 15 years older than me. Plus, you know, it's Yakov Smirnoff. So things go on, and I start doing his social media for him. So now he's paying me. And about six months into this friendship, uh, he calls me, and just out of the blue, he asks me if I would like to go from Mumbai to Dubai with him on a cruise ship that he's performing on. Mumbai, Dubai, do I want to go? Bye-bye. I can't go to the Middle East for two and a half weeks with Yakov Smirnoff. What are you talking about? I have a, I have a seven-year-old at home. Did I mention that uh, it was all first class and everything was paid? Yeah, I went on the trip. So at the very beginning of the trip, uh, Yakov and I flew first class to Paris. We had a little layover there, and then we went on to Mumbai. By the time we get to Mumbai, we've been traveling for like maybe almost 40 hours. And we're both super tired. We get a car at the airport, and it drives us uh, to our hotel about an hour into the city. And, and, I, and I've traveled extensively because I was a flight attendant, but I have never been anywhere in India, and I've never seen anything like I'm seeing. Uh, so we're going to our hotel and I'm looking out the car windows and uh, it's quite colorful. There's bright billboards, uh, but there's also an extremely large amount of people, as you know. I mean, there's just humanity everywhere, a lot of people, and there's a lot of poverty. And I just never saw anything like it. And then we get to the hotel and before we were getting out of the cab, I reach into my bag to get a couple of dollars to tip the driver. And I can't find my wallet, and I can't find my wallet, and then I realize I lost my wallet. Yeah, I didn't have my wallet. I had a passport, but that's it. So I have to say to Yakov Smirnov, um, hey, Yakov, listen, um, I, I don't have my wallet. And he says, it's okay. I got this. No problem. And now I'm thinking, well, do I call my sister in Pittsburgh and have her like wire me money to the embassy? Or do I trust Yakov Smirnov? 
So I trust him. Yes. Okay. Uh, so we go up to the room in the hotel. And before we're even unpacked, I go into the bathroom to brush my teeth. And I'm even using like the, the amenity kit from the airplane. And as I'm brushing my teeth, all of a sudden, a laminate comes off my front tooth. Yeah, a laminate. It's like a fake fingernail on your tooth. And underneath that laminate is like, God forbid, like the most horrendous thing you've ever seen. It's like a little green peg tooth because all the enamel is off. So now I lost my wallet 15 minutes ago. And I got to walk out of this bathroom holding my tooth and say to Yakov Smirnov, hey, I am, um, <clears throat> I know I just lost my wallet, but um, I just lost my tooth as well. And he says, it's okay, it's okay, I got this. So then Yakov and I go out into the streets of Mumbai, which are just like I said, so wild and very, very crowded. And it's 110 degrees out, outside. And I have my, my scarf up around my face because I don't want to scare the lepers on the streets if they see this pirate tooth. We go in and out of every store in Mumbai asking for like stick it in or ment it in or something to put this tooth back on. And nobody understands what we're saying. The language barrier is huge. They keep giving me toothpaste and they give Yakov Indian Viagra. So then it happened, it happened uh, all day long. We couldn't find any place. So the next day, Yakov has an idea to call the concierge and find a dentist. Well, guess what? It worked. Next thing you know, within like 10 minutes, there's a cab outside. And we take it about 15 minutes outside of the city. And there, we stand outside this like eight-story high dilapidated medical building and I'm about to get some dental work done. So it's just absurd. But we go, on, we go in the building, we go upstairs, and the office is actually quite nice. Uh, it's totally sophisticated. There's computer screens. And uh, while they bonded my tooth back on, they gave Yakov a foot massage. And then the bill comes. It's 4,000 rupees. And as you know, I don't have any rupees. The good news is Yakov paid that, and it was only 60 bucks. So uh, a couple of days later, we get on this ship. And now we're going to get on the ship. We're going to Oman and Abu Dhabi and Dubai. And, uh, and as soon as we get on the ship, uh, Yakov lays down to take a nap. Now, I have not gone to the bathroom, like, really well since we were in the States. And it's been, like, three and a half days. So I go in the bathroom of the ship and I use the bathroom and then I turn around and I flush it, but it doesn't flush, not well. And I flush it again and now it starts backing up like the water in the toilet is backing up and I'm looking around this luxury bathroom with these white fluffy towels. And I just start grabbing them and throwing them at the toilet. I mean, I, I, kept, I capture myself in the mirror. I see myself in the mirror. I'm like sweating and I'm crazed. And now I'm trying to stop the flow of the toilet. And I can't. So I end up leaving the bathroom, throwing like these white fluffy towels, bathroom, like bathrobes on the floor and getting out, squeezing out of the bathroom and closing the door. And I see Yakov laying on the bed. And beyond that, I see my cell phone sitting on a little table. And so I instinctively run over and I grab that cell phone and I text my sister 8,000 miles away in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I say, help, toilet backed up, yak off sleeping, poop on the floor. And she writes back, you bonehead, wait till he wakes up and tell him. And I'm like, no, I cannot tell him that I plugged up the toilet on the ship. I can't. That's impossible. So I sit on the edge of the bed, and I wait for Yakov to wake up. And he wakes up, and he looks at me, and he says, what happened now? And I said, well, you see, we have to leave the room for a little while. And then they're going to come in and clean the bathroom, and then we'll come back. And anyway, we did. And... Just like a luxury cruise ship should do and provide, they came and they cleaned 
the bathroom. All right, so that's the end of that story. I mean, I think the upshot of it is that you can lose your, uh, you can lose your wallet maybe in Paris or on the plane, and you can lose your tooth in Mumbai, and you can lose your ship on a plane or on a ship. Uh, but if you're with Yaakov Smirnoff, it, it, it was okay. Now, the upshot of all of this is uh, that Yaakov and I continued to date. Yeah, at that point, we're dating for maybe like six more months. In fact, we went on another cruise to Greece. But then I started realizing that he was much more conservative than me. Like, he would say things like, uh, could you not wear pants? And he would say things like, uh, uh, you know, Christine, I don't mind woman with career, but I don't want career woman. Like, what the hell is that mean? He actually said to me, Christine, there will always be millions of people in the world that are very, very poor, and millions of people in the world that will be very, very rich. What do you want? I kind of want to be with a guy who's taller than me. Uh, but look, it's all good. And I heard recently that Yakov uh, got married. And I wish him well. And I hope that his wife gets to wear pants. Thank you. I hear the applause. I swear I hear it. Yeah. Hey, this is so much fun, you guys. We're going to keep it going. We've got a couple of more storytellers for you. This guy, I just love this guy. He was on Storyworthy a few months ago, and he also played Story Smash. And, in fact, he killed on Story Smash. I mean, he just totally wiped everybody out, and he won the night. And the next time we go live with Story Smash, Samson McCormick will be here. Uh, you guys, Samson McCormick is an experience. It's very true. He is a down-to-earth comedic force of nature, and for two decades, he's been one of the most in-demand voices of, of diversity in comedy. He's appeared on BET, TV One, Fox Soul, and Viceland. You guys, wherever you are, put your hands together for the amazing Samson McCormick. Hey, y'all. Happy Sunday. This is, this is so good to be here uh, sharing stories. This is amazing. So I'm going to get right into my story. My story, uh, I am from D.C. My family is from North Carolina. I grew up um, raised by a very religious family. I'm talking about, like, religious. The women didn't wear makeup. Um, you know, the, the guys, they were, they would, on Sundays, they would go to church, and they were, like, deacons and stuff like that. But on the weekends, like, they would, like, Friday night, they would come home, and they would, like, drink moonshine. And they would crawl around on the floor until Saturday night. They would be right back up on Sunday, ready to go to church. So there was a lot of hypocrisy, but at the same time, uh, they they just taught us a lot. A lot of those good old fashioned uh, Pentecostal values. Um, I don't know if y'all have been up at like two o'clock in the morning and seeing like Peter Popoff talking about sending in twenty five dollars, and for twenty five dollars. He'll send you some miracle spring water. Those are the people I come from. Okay, the black ones. So um, it was, there was a lot. I, growing up, did know that there was something different about me. Um, and, you know, there weren't, there weren't many conversations about sex, you know, in my family growing up. Um, if you had sex, or, or first of all, you didn't have sex, that was number one. And number two, if you were to even kiss a girl, you would get her pregnant. Okay, that was the education. If you kiss a girl, you'll get her pregnant. You gotta, you know, take a chaperone with you on a date. That's where I come from. So, of course, whenever I got in about the first grade and I started to figure out that I didn't quite like girls, I knew that I was going to be in some sort of trouble, but I didn't know how. And it wasn't until I got to maybe, I mean, I heard things like growing up, I knew that, you know, you couldn't commit adultery, you couldn't commit fornication, stuff like that. And then when I got, I guess, about 13 or 14, I discovered at church a term called homosexuality. I didn't know what it was. Um, I didn't know who one was. I didn't know how you did it. But all I know is that when the pastor said it, the church went up in smoke, 
Like everybody would just be like, oh, oh my God, oh my Lord, not a homosexual, oh Lord. And then the pastor would explain what that was. So he'd be like, these homosexuals, these disgusting people bringing the damn nation of Jesus upon our families and communities. They bring thunderstorms. Like they would, they would, <laughs> they, would, they, would they would, they would preach things like that. And I didn't know what it was. I just, I thought it was like a mutant or something. I thought it was one of the X-Men. I didn't know what a homosexual was. I just knew they bought thunderstorms. They made buildings fall. They bought earthquakes. They made everybody scary. And it really was the same sort of reaction that you see on the X-Men. So I thought it was like Cyclops or something. I really didn't know what a homosexual was. It wasn't until he said, these boys who kiss boys. No, he said, these girls who kiss girls and these boys who kiss boys. And I was like, oh my God, I am one of the homosexuals. I have power to bring thunder. Oh my God. And uh, at the same time, I felt, I felt really guilty. But one of the earliest messages that I also heard was that uh, AIDS, which, you know, I am a product of the 80s. Um, I'm a lot older than I look. Black don't crack. Hey, hey, y'all. Um, I'm holding it together over here with Shea Butter and Jesus. Hey, um, <laughs> I am a, I'm a product of the 80s. And so anybody who was around during that time, you know, similar to as we see right now, there were a lot of social political issues going on that were really affecting people. And the biggest one was AIDS. And uh, of course, they were teaching us that AIDS was God's punishment to gay people. Right. So when I got a little bit older and, and I did, I was a late bloomer, but, you know, I started experimenting a little bit as a lot of youth do with their sexuality. It's like, you don't know what you're doing. Nobody quite explains it, but you know, you got these feelings and you want to see what's going on. And, um, you know, I had started kind of going out and I, okay, this, this does not leave the room y'all. I'm only telling y'all this because y'all are my special friends. Okay. Um, this does not leave the room. So, oh my God. Okay. Look, so y'all, I kissed my first dude. Don't tell nobody. It was so gay. <laughs> it was so gay. Oh my God. I was like, this is going to create a thunderstorm. Okay. It was, no, it was, I was really, I was, I was nervous and I was scared. And I didn't quite understand it because it, it just, it was what it was. That was who I was and that was what I knew and what I was interested in. And um, so I did a little bit more later. I will, I will spare y'all the details of that because I am a gentleman. But uh, I then learned about things like STDs. And, um, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I caught one, y'all. I caught, I caught one of the STDs. I caught gonorrhea. Oh, my God. So uh, by that time, I was 18 when I was going that far. And um, I didn't even go, like, all the way. I just, I will say there, there's more than, more than one way to catch that, okay? Um, and, and, but I, I managed to catch it like a little Pokemon. And so by that time, I was able to go to the doctor's appointments by myself um, because up until I was about 17, my mom would sit in the room with me while the doctor did whatever the doctor had to do. So thankfully, I didn't catch, I'm not thankfully, I'm not happy that I caught an STD, but thankfully, I did catch one like after I was old enough to go to the doctor and be in there by myself. And I found out what that was. And he also explained to me about HIV and AIDS. And I was like, oh, my God, the pastor was saying this in the service. So I'm like, oh, my God. I found out one of the one of the symptoms that they talk about is fever and I believe like a, a bad flu or something like that. So the week after I caught the STD and I took the you used to have to take like they give you like a shot in the butt or something now. Um, but, you know, back then you had to take like two weeks worth of medicine or something like that. And uh, and, and the week after I caught the med, the week after I took the medicine, uh, y'all, I caught a really bad cold. So, you know what I was thinking? I was like, I caught HIV. So I had to go to a clinic 
to get tested. And I prayed all the way to the clinic. I was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Um, if you please can just give me some sort of sign, like, I don't know if, if you please give me a sign that like, that I'm okay. Like I knew that being gay wasn't a choice. And so I was like, I just need a sign. I was like, I need a sign. Um, I'm not a bad person. Please forgive me. I just need a sign. So I go into this clinic and I'm up in there getting tested. And this really beautiful black lady, like just had a really sweet spirit, uh, took me in and she tested me and she asked me a bunch of questions. And um, now you can get a rapid test. Back then you had to wait like 20 minutes to get your results. And that 20 minutes could literally send you into a nervous breakdown. So I'm like praying. I'm like, oh my God. Um, and, and she knew I was nervous. And so I explained to her that, uh, you know, the pastor said that, you know, if you were gay, you weren't married to something like that, you would catch STDs and you might get HIV if you were gay. And um, she said the craziest thing to me. She said, you, how old are you? And I was like, I'm, I'm 18. She was like, you need to loosen up. She was like, sex is good. God made sex for people to have and you need to enjoy yourself. Do you know why I'm so lighthearted and laid back? And I was like, why? She was like, because I got laid last night, okay? And you need to do it too, just use protection. And I'm looking at her like totally go against everything that I was taught growing up. And I'm like, this heifer is crazy, okay? Um, so 20 minutes later, she brings the test back in and my test result came back negative. And so I like pass out on the floor and I'm like, oh my goodness, mind you, I had still been praying for a sign, and I promise y'all, she gives me my results. She gives me a list of resources to educate myself about sex and sexuality and all those different things. And then she walks me to the door to let me out. Her next client to get tested was the pastor from my church. I promise you. And then that's when it hit me that the Lord does work in some mysterious ways. And that's it. That's it. That's it, y'all. <laughs> True story. <laughs> Thank y'all. Follow me on Instagram if you can, at Samson McCormick. Thank y'all. How great was that, you guys? <laughs> I'm so glad you're okay, for going to say. Me that too. Is, uh, that's dramatic. That is definitely dramatic. Thank you for sharing that story. You crack me up, man. All right, you guys, we're going to keep the show rolling. Hope everybody's doing well. Uh, looks like there's a couple of message, messages coming in. You see there's a chat box to your right-hand side if you haven't uh, tuned into that. Check out that chat box, and we're uh, highlighting people's socials, etc. And there's also a link there to uh, donate to the show on Venmo. And just so you know, I am sharing this money with the wonderful people on the show and with my producer who's in the other room. All right, you guys, this next fabulous talent coming on, she just cracks me up, Melanie Maris. She's a comedian who comes from the Philippines. Now, she hosts shows all over the world when we're not in quarantine. And you guys can watch her new comedy special, which is called Brash Girls Club on Tubi, T-U-B-I. You guys, put your hands together for the fabulous Melanie Maris. Hi. Um, Christine, thank you so much, uh, for having me. This is so fun. I am not from the Philippines. Uh, close, close. Um, I'll just start my story and then you'll find out where I'm from. Uh, so I grew up in Indonesia, which is also in Southeast Asia. It's just like to the left of the Philippines, if you're looking at a map. Um, and, and like, if it's not totally evident, my dad is Asian, my mom's white, I'm beautiful. That's what 23andMe told me. Uh, and I, I went to an international school growing up, which is why I sound like I'm Malibu Barbie, even though I grew up on the equator. So when my dad, uh, when I was growing up in Indonesia, my dad would say really, really charming things to me. Like he would say, Melanie, you have a terrible personality. But at 10, like, what else do you have going for you? You know what I'm saying? Like, what else are you bringing to the table at 10 besides your personality? Uh, which is why I guess he then gave me a copy of this book. It was called How to Win Friends and Influence People. Um, I don't know if he thought maybe I could put this to good use at the tetherball courts. I'm just, I'm, I'm just not sure. Um, now, my dad loved Nat King Cole, and his favorite Nat King Cole song was Smile. And uh, if you guys don't know this song, 
Uh, the lyrics are like, um, smile though your heart is aching, smile even though it's breaking. Um, which truly should be like the tagline for stand-up comedy, uh, foreshadowing much. Um, so during this time, I really fell in love with Jesus because I felt like I needed a heavenly father because my earthly father was doing such a shitty job. Um, and this is just, this is a hot tip for all the dads out there and future dads. Um, if you have a daughter, uh, go ahead and try to not be a dick to her. Um, because what will happen is as soon as she leaves your house, she's just going to be gagging on dicks, you know, looking for your love. Uh, I mean, I'm not Freud or anything, but just, just my little hot tip. Okay. So that was before this is now, uh, now my dad is, he's old, you know, he's a little old man and I'm big. Uh, and he's quite sick, you know, because hate will do that to you. will just poison you from the inside out. Uh, so he came to Los Angeles to go to Cedar sinai to get some surgery. Um, and I took, I took him there and I was, I, I was waiting for him in the waiting room while he was, he was back in the surgery area. And while I'm waiting, there's this huge kerfuffle behind me. And so somebody's saying like, what do you mean? I got to leave my bags here. I got to go in. I can't come back down. I don't, I don't understand what you're saying to me. I turn around. It's Larry David. Uh, it's the most curb your enthusiasm moment I've, I've, I've truly ever experienced. And it's like, I am ecstatic because I have a huge crush on Larry David. And this is the closest we've ever been, you know? And now he's about to go back there and have surgery at the same time as my father, you know? So I'm just like beside myself. I'm so happy. Anyways, hours pass. Um, the nurse comes out. She says, your father's out of surgery. He survived. Uh, he wants to see you. So I, I go back there and um, maybe he's in his little hospital gown and he's like, he's hooked up to all of these monitors and tubes and he's, he's so fragile, you know? And he kind of beckons me uh, to come down closer to him. And I was like, oh, you know, here I am. I'm his little baby girl, literally the only one uh, at his bedside. And I think he's gonna tell me that he loves me. So I, I lean down and he looks at me, he says, these people, don't know that I'm a king. So um, if you're getting kind of like Asian Logan Roy vibes from my dad, that's absolutely correct. Uh, so then it's like, you know, he goes to his room uh, at Cedars and what am I thinking? I'm thinking Larry had surgery at the same time as my father in the same area as my father. Larry's in this same part of the floor. What do I do? I take a lap. I take a lap. I'm looking for Larry. Um, I just craned my head into every uh, every patient's door. You know, they might have just been cracked just like a jar, like a bit. Um, let me tell you, I witnessed personal, uh, personal moments um, between families, people truly hanging on to life by a thread, something a stranger should absolutely not bear witness to. But I couldn't be deterred because I was looking for Larry. I didn't find him. Uh, it was very sad. So a few days pass. I'm in my dad's uh, hospital room, and you know, I'm just holding a jug of his urine. And um, he's yelling at me as he's as he's wont to do. Um, and he's telling me what a shitty daughter I am, and how much he hates me, uh, and what a piece of shit I am. How he'd rather die than have a daughter like me. Uh, and while he's telling me this, I'm looking around the room, and all over the room are pillows. And I'm thinking, all I have to do is take one of these eight pillows and put it over your face for two to three minutes. And I never have to listen to this ever again. And you guys, I got away with it. Can you imagine if I confessed to a murder on a Zoom storytelling show? Uh, no, I didn't. I didn't do it. And, and thank God, because um, <laughs> my friend later told me, you know, oh, you know, Cedar sinai is a state of the art medical facility. They will know if he died of suffocation and not like, you know, the lung cancer, diabetes, uh, TB, uh, heart condition that he has. So, you know, just as well, because I wouldn't, I'm not built for prison. Um, so anyway, so while this is happening, somebody gets wheeled by my father's door. Who do you think it is? It's Larry David. He's getting discharged. He's laughing. Um, you know, he's making jokes for the nurses. And I'm just like, oh my God, Larry's been here this whole time. And I've been in here with this guy. And I, you know, I put the jug of my father's urine down. I just do a light trot out to the hallway, you know, just to see the elevator doors closing 
behind Larry's wheelchair. So that was sad. Um, my father gets discharged from the hospital. Now he moves across the street to the hotel across the street. And at this point, I have, um, I have gotten my brother to come over from Indonesia to help me with my dad. So my brother's there and he and I are, are giving my dad a bath. And I don't know if you've ever washed the 82 year old asshole, the man you've spent your whole life hating, but um, I really, I did, I did lose my will to live. Um, and I kind of thought, you know, that the most inappropriate thing that my brother and I would ever do was this kissing game that he made me play when I was five and he was 12, but I was wrong. Um, <laughs> okay. So then my dad has his like last follow-up visit at Cedars. We go to Cedars to the doctor's office. And they only let two people back with the patient and, and my mother's there. She's useless by the way. She's been at the Beverly center this whole time. So, and then my brother, he's like my pet rock. You know what I mean? So my dad chooses me. So it's me and my mom go back there with my dad. As soon as we get back to the, the examining room, my brother texts me, Larry David's here. I said, oh my God. You know, and so I'm just waiting, 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 waiting for this, this appointment with the doctor to be over. Finally, uh, it, it's over. Uh, and I, you know, I just trot out there to the waiting room and uh, it's just my pet rock sitting out there. And I said... Where's Larry David? My brother says, he left. And I said, well, did you at least show him my picture? My brother says, no. So just like that, Larry just walked right out of my life. Um, I really feel like Larry and I could have like five, six good years together, uh, but that's, that's not happening. So anyway, so my dad is getting ready to go back to Indonesia and he wants to have this heart to heart talk with me. And uh, so I, I sit down with him and he says, you know, Mel, it doesn't matter what you're doing here, what you're trying to do, because you will never in all your life make as much money as me. Uh, those were his part, parting words to me. And you know, I've really, I, I'm a person who my whole life, I've really believed everything that my father ever told me about myself. You know, that I'm nothing, uh, I'm never gonna do anything, I'm never gonna be anybody. Um, but just recently, I just sold my very first TV show um like a real life tv show to a very big deal place and it's about a girl who hates her indonesian father and she loves jesus and she loves to suck a dick and she's done everything wrong her whole life and she's finally trying to get it right and become the woman she was always meant to be so you would think that my first call would be to my dad you know what i mean that the greatest success of my life is is based on him being such a shitty father but you know i thought well what is that what does that mean? Aren't I just measuring him, myself by his shitty value system? What am I saying that just because HBO says I have value, I do? So I didn't call him. I said, fuck him. You know, you can just read about it in Deadline like everybody else. Um, that's my story. Uh, please follow me everywhere at Trouble Jones. And um, please watch my comedy special on Tubi. We've got nothing but time and it's free. That was amazing. Holy cow, holy cow. Melanie Maris, first of all, I, okay, first of all, this is a real TV show, okay? So, you know, it's on Zoom, sure, but listen, it's a real show. Uh, also, Melanie, I swear, man, you can kick my ass when you see me next. I feel so bad that I stay here from the Philippines. I can't believe it. You're gonna get the first, you can kick first because I feel like an idiot. I mean, that bordered on racist. It really did. And I know you're from Indonesia and I apologize. Thank you again. Put your hands together wherever you are, you guys. Melanie Maris, Kelly Spillman, and the wonderful Samson McCormick. And I'd also like to thank my amazing producer, 13 year old Alabama Bardos. Thanks, Alabama. We'll see you guys next week. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us on the Story Worthy Podcast. We'll be back next week with all new stories. Subscribe.